Hi, so I'm Paul Montehan from Infinera, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about coherent evolution, uh, both in terms of the evolution to high speed embedded optical engines uh, and to coherent pluggables. We'll also talk about the role of expanders and rodems in next generation IP optical networks. Let's start by looking at some of the key technology enablers for next generation IP optical networks. Uh, the first uh, enabler is the CMOS evolution, that's the silicon, uh, and with each process node evolution, uh, we get more processing power, uh, we reduce the power consumption, uh, and we reduce the area. Uh, a second enabler is photonic integration, uh, and this particularly applies to the uh, coherent uh, optical engines. Uh, and the ability to integrate more optical functions into a single, com into a single uh, photonic integrated circuit, as well as the evolution to higher board rates. And then thirdly, we also have a lot of innovation going on in terms of the rodems and the line systems. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that uh, more uh, later on. So let's start with the switch router silicon. Uh, this has been driven by the CMOS process node evolution, uh, and that's taken us from 1.28 terabits per second, uh, based on 40 nanometer uh, in 2012, to today's state of the art, which is 25.6 terabits per second uh, on a chip based on seven nanometer CMOS. Uh, and there's a roadmap for that, of that to uh, double every uh, couple of years based on the CMOS process node improvements, uh, 5 nanometer, then 3 nanometer, 2.1 nanometer, then 1.5 nanometer, taking us all the way to 409.6 terabits per second uh, on a single ASIC. So next, let's look at the evolution of the coherent optical engines. If we look inside a coherent optical engine, we see the digital ASIC DSP, uh, we see the analog electronics uh, and we see the photonics. There's a few other uh, bits and pieces like the RF interconnects and sometimes uh, additional amplification. But those are the main building blocks. And it's really driven by the digital ASIC DSP and the photonics. And the digital ASIC DSP is driven by the same CMOS process node evolution as the switch router ASICs. Uh, with the photonics, we see photonic integration, which is combining multiple uh, photonic functions, things like the laser, the modulator, the photodetector, uh, combiners, muxes, uh, and so on into uh, a single uh, photonic uh, integrated circuit. Uh, and the other evolution that we see there is the evolution to higher board rates. Uh, and you put these two things together, and that's taken us from 100 gig uh, based on 65 nanometer CMOS in kind of the 2010-2012 time frame, all the way to today's state-of-the-art 800 gig wavelength uh, optical engines uh, like Infinera's i6 uh, based on 7 nanometer CMOS. Uh, and you can see the, the role of the CMOS uh, in terms of driving that evolution of the coherent in terms of the number of transistors per DSP. So we've gone from less than 100 million transistors per, per, per ASIC, digital ASIC with the 100 gig hard decision FEC, all the way up to uh, more than 5 billion transistors. And that provides the processing power uh, for advanced functionality like Nyquist subcarriers and probabilistic constellation shaping, as well as enabling the higher board rates. So with each CMOS process node evolution, we get more processing power per millimeter squared and per watt. And there are really three ways we can take advantage of this. Uh, one option is to maximize the performance building a, a big, powerful uh, digital ASIC uh, maximizing the board rate, integrating all the latest, uh, most advanced optical features in order to maximize the capacity reach, uh, both in terms of the wavelength and spectral efficiency. A second option is to minimize the space and power uh, to build a smaller, more efficient digital ASIC uh, and to get into pluggable form factors, as an example. And then a third way is we can take that additional processing power we have on the digital ASIC uh, and instead of putting advanced optical features, we can integrate systems level functions, functions related to things like manageability, encryption, muxing, that previously would have lived on the uh, shelf or controller or the uh, card, and we can put those into the digital ASIC. 
If you want to know more about this, there's uh, actually a, a, a pretty detailed uh, new Infinera white paper that goes into a lot of detail. But to give you one example, with the i6 embedded optical engine and embedded optical engines in general, we are um, really maximizing the performance uh, with a, a powerful uh, digital ASIC, uh, putting uh, ultra high board rates and advanced features. Uh, there's uh, some reductions in power and footprint, but there uh, and some advanced systems level functions. Uh, but the the focus really is on maximizing the performance and putting in the advanced optical features. So let's now look at the pluggables. These prioritize the three vectors differently from the embedded optical engines, which focus on maximizing performance. With the first generation of 400 gig coherent pluggables, the focus really was on minimizing space and power with a small power efficient DSP in order to get into the uh, QSF PDD, CFP2 and OSFP uh, form factors. If we look now at something like uh, Infinera's XR Optics, uh, what we're doing is prioritizing the vectors slightly differently. Well, we're still minimizing space and power uh, to the extent that we can go into things like QSF PDD and CFP2 form factors. We're also integrating some advanced optical features like digital subcarriers, and in particular, integrating uh, a lot of systems level functions uh, like remote management, uh, demarcation, encryption, uh, spectrum analyzer. Uh, and you put these two things together, uh, and in addition to enabling point-to-point -point coherent wavelengths, we can now do point-to-multipoint uh, with digital subcarrier aggregation. So taking uh, 25 uh, gig subcarriers uh, from spoke, multiple spokes and aggregating them optically onto a single hub site. And what we can also do with the integrated system level functions is we can put that pluggable into a router uh, and it will act as a virtual transponder, providing demarcation between the, the router and the optical network. So one of the big questions that comes up uh, with coherent pluggables is, do I put it into a, into a router uh, or do I still have an expander? Uh, is there still a need for an expander? And there are benefits to both approaches. Uh, with the router, you can save some cost in terms of the expander, the shelf, and the gray pluggables. You can reduce the footprint, uh, you can reduce power consumption, you can simplify cabling, uh, and you can have simplified routers with QSF PDD uh, only ports, for example. On the other hand, uh, with an external expander, you get the demarcation, uh, you're not dependent on the router software for the optical features, you get pricing independence. Uh, you always have efficient router utilization, even if you're having to run that coherent uh, interface at uh, maybe 300, 200 gig or, or 100 gig. Um, you, you're not requiring a, a router port with specific uh, power and thermal capabilities and form factor, so it's compatible with legacy routers. Uh, and then in the future, you'll be able to more quickly adopt the latest optical technology. And then another advantage is you can leverage higher performance CFP2s, which, which don't have the uh, same faceplate density as the QSF PDDs. So lots of advantages also on the expander side. Uh, one clue as to how operators are going to uh, choose between these two options uh, is this OIF survey. Uh, and here you can see that around 70% are planning on using an expander either exclusively uh, or as a mix of expanders uh, and routers. Uh, so expanders uh, are not going away. So as the switch router ASIC scale to tens of terabits per second and then eventually to hundreds of terabits per second, the question that comes up is, do we still need rodems? Is there still a role for optical layer switching? Uh, and before we answer that question, uh, let's first look at three uh, rodem myths that you sometimes hear. The first is that rodem innovation is slow. Uh, and this just isn't true. Over the last 20 years, there's been a steady stream of Rodem innovation uh, regarding the WSS, uh, which has evolved to higher port counts uh, and has shrunk in terms of footprint. It's also added things like FlexiGrid, increased the, uh, the, the spectrum um, with things like uh, uh, extended C-band uh, and more recently with C plus L uh, on the same WSS. 
Uh, we've also seen innovations in terms of the optical channel monitoring, uh, in terms of the OSC, in terms of the link control. So there's been a lot of innovation in terms of the Rodum, and that is continuing with things like uh, Quad WSS, uh, even higher port counts, uh, and uh, C plus L WSS. Uh, a second myth is that Rodum costs are very high. Uh, and well, there can be an element of truth to that. It really depends on the type of Rodum. You have broadcast and select, you have route and select, you have the different types of add drop, fix, CD, CDC. Uh, you've got different uh, numbers of ports on the WSS. So uh, uh, one by two, one by four, one by 32. Um, so the, really, the cost really depends on the type of Rodum. What you see is that with a, a two or four degree Rodum based on broadcast and select with fixed add drop, uh, the cost is typically not much more than that of a FODUM. The, the delta is actually quite small. And most of the nodes in a typical Rodum network are two or three degrees. Um, the third myth is that Rodum costs are static. And if we look at the analyst numbers from the likes of light counting and Omdia, uh, and we look, compare like for like Rodum component costs, things like uh, uh, WSS with the same number of ports uh, or EDFA amplifiers uh, or multicast switch, the, the costs are declining uh, between 8% and 14%. Now, a Rodum degree, um, particularly a core Rodum node, uh, the, the cost may not decline that quickly because you are adding performance uh, and functionality and that will take you to more expensive components, which has uh, an upwards uh, uh, pressure on the costs. Uh, but what we do see is a lot of innovations uh, at the edge uh, in terms of the WSS and the amplifiers, uh, enabling things like node on a blade with quad WSSs, and this is driving down the cost of edge rodents. We also see that with fewer uh, add drop ports with, with the higher speed wavelengths, that also uh, can reduce the rodent costs. Okay, and the, the, so to answer the original question, do we still need Rodums? The answer is yes. Uh, here are the top three reasons to deploy a Rodum. Uh, the first is uh, you significantly uh, reduce CapEx with Rodums as compared to hop by hop uh, routing. So typically what we see is that you reduce the number of coherent interfaces by between uh, a factor of two and a factor of five, though it can actually be a much higher in long haul networks. Uh, and what this does is it typically saves five coherent interfaces per Rodum degree in the metro, uh, and it can be 10 plus in long haul. So you, you're getting significant CapEx savings um, by deploying Rodums. You've also got a much more scalable and future-proof solution. Uh, it's much easier to transition to uh, the uh, future coherent generations uh, if you have Rodum. Uh, you can select the best, uh, uh, best in class optical engines uh, and the cost of, uh, of pass through is zero with the Rodum versus you need two coherent interfaces with, uh, uh, with hop by hop routing. So scaling the network in terms of capacity is a lot more cost effective if you have a Rodum based solution. And then thirdly, um, there's still a very significant and lucrative market for private line services. Uh, particularly uh, as this transitions to the high speed private lines, uh, 10 gig uh, and 100 gig uh, plus private lines. And the standards and products for uh, this high speed circuit emulation, they currently don't exist. So if you want to offer uh, non IP high speed private line services, uh, then Rodums is really a, a must have. So to summarize, CMOS, Photonic, and Rodum innovations are enabling IP optical evolution. It's not a case of pluggables or embedded as regards the coherent optical engines. It's both. They prioritize the evolution vectors differently and both have an important role to play. Regarding the pluggables, XR Optics also brings a, a transformative point to multipoint coherence option uh, that's ideal for metro aggregation. Uh, expanders don't go away, they still have many advantages, and the majority of operators will continue to deploy expanders either exclusively or uh, as part of a mixed strategy with pluggables in routers uh, in some scenarios and uh, pluggables in expanders in other scenarios. And even as the router silicon scales to hundreds of terabits, Rodum still have an important role to play. 
uh, offering significant capex savings, a scalable and future-proof solution, uh, and the ability to deliver private line services.